أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأن محمدا عبده رسوله إن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار اللهم أجرنا من النار وادخلنا الجنة مع الأبرار اللهم اشرح قلوبنا للإيمان والإسلام Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open up our chest, our heart to understand and absorb this beautiful religion and to apply what we learn Ya Rabbil Alameen show us the right right and help us to follow the truth and show us the wrong wrong, wrong and help us to avoid the false Ya Rabbil Alameen Ya Allah bring victory to all the people who struggle in the way to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala those people who they struggle in, uh, in just earning a simple life, in this life, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Those oppressed people, Ya Allah, give them victory, Ya Arhamar Rahameen. Those people who died fighting for their freedom and for their right, Ya Allah, make them martyr, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and give them paradise, Ameen. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala heal the wounded people, those are the oppressed one, whether they were in Palestine or anywhere in the world, Ya Allah. May Allah give them, Ya Rabbil Alameen, medication and help them to heal fast and clothe them because they're naked, Ya Allah, and feed them because they're hungry, Ya Allah. Give them drink because they're thirsty, Ya Allah. Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask you in your beautiful names to accept our prayers and supplication, Ya Allah, all over the world. The Muslim are begging you, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, answer their dua, Ya Rabbil Alameen. So uh, we are 28 halaqa today and we finished the year second of the city of Medina. So we are uh, going to the third hijriya of the city of Medina and many, many, many things happened just right after uh, Ghazwat uh, Badr. So we spent like three halaqa for the battle uh, of Badr. And what happened after that now Look how Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam training and educating combat, uh, combat kind of training uh, so they can be ready more for next time war. Because even though they win the battle in Badr, but uh, the uh, enemy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala run away after they, they face the reality that their leaders, six, seven of them get killed right there. So all these people, when they get killed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the angels and they saw their eyes tall people and not familiar face the one was fighting so uh, the fear uh, the terror came in their heart and the rain did not help we said the side of the disbelievers so they ran away leaving behind all the uh, property they brought it with them including sometimes camels and animal and food whatever they brought it with them left behind and they ran away and we talked about those in detail. But now, so that's only the beginning now. This is the first official war engaged between uh, the believers and the disbelievers, right? So right now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the permission to the believers to be ready to prepare. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَعِدُّوا لَهُمْ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةِ وَمِنْ رِبَاطِ الْخَيْلِ Prepare yourself as the believers, how much you can, whether it can be preparing animal, to fight with, like the, the vehicle you use for fighting. Uh, it could be horse, it could be camel, it could be anything. And uh, the body has to be ready to fight. Uh, the human being has to be ready to fight. So the human uh, being need to be trained. That's why people who they, you know, go to war today, they have to prepare at least six months. Uh, they call them combat, right? to be ready, how to fight, how to carry the weapon, how to, you know, uh, face the enemy and on. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did the same, exactly the same. Uh, and let's see what, what happened now uh, after uh, Ghazwat Badr. So the first one, it says, Ma al-Kidr fi Bani Salim, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, seven days only passed when he left uh, the places of Badr, Right, we say that after he defeated the enemy, he stayed three days and night in the same area he fought, right? In case, what if the enemy changed their mind and come back? So there were three days staying, did not come back home unless they send messengers to the city of Medina, bringing the good news to them. 
And after that three days, now seven days only, he is in the city of Medina. He prepared himself again. So what did he do? He went, uh, he took a group of people with him and he went Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to uh, a tribe called Bani Salim. This is a bigger tribe of Arab who they live around the city of Medina. They were not Muslim. So he went there and he went to area where they have also uh, uh, a well, uh, you know, full of water. So they, he went there and but people, uh, why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa so early, seven days only, he just finished the battle of Bitter, has to go out with a group of people with him, ready to fight, because he got eyes and spy around the city of Medina, right? So he heard that Bani Salim, this is the tribe, who they are preparing to come and attack Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and city of Medina in purpose to kill Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So the Prophet was ready before they came. That's why he went. So he went and he took all these people. And when Bani Salim heard that Rasulullah sallallahu came out and ready so fast, they get scared. And they get scared. They left all their property and their food and they went uh, to the mountains. Let's talk a little bit about the geography of the city of Medina. City of Medina is a little bit different than city of Mecca, right? We know city of Mecca, yes, it has a lot of mountains, but those mountains in city of Mecca also are not that steep. Maybe the steepest mountain or the highest is where Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi used to go up in Kaf, Ghar Hira, uh, where he used to go up before the revelation. Maybe that was the highest. The rest are just a small peak of, you know, steep mountains, made of rocks, and those are the considered uh, mountains. And then you have valleys, most likely a lot of valleys and flat land in city of Mecca. But city of Medina, subhanAllah, it's surrounded by mountains and a huge mountains, chain of mountains. The only entrance officially the city of Medina has, it come from the north. So if this is the city of Medina and Mecca is in the south, so whoever enemy gonna come, to enter the city of Medina, they have to come all the way from the path where they use it to go to Damascus or Bilad al-Sham to do uh, import export business like the caravan. Then you have to come from the north to come because mountains, it stop there and it become like an opening. So why I'm saying this geographically important city of Medina because we're gonna know in the fifth of Al-Hijra, we're gonna have Ghazwat al-Khandaq where subhanAllah, as if it's like uh, city of Medina, it's written inside a castle and surrounded instead of uh, uh, human-made uh, uh, sage uh, uh, gates, but it's done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by, by these uh, mountains. Instead of creating fortress, uh, as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the city of Medina with this mountain. And that was a genius idea also for Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to accept to come to the city of Medina. He never visited before. He came as a young boy with his mom at the age of six. But uh, what he remember, he doesn't remember much. But it's iha from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where Allah prepared him to go to that city and find himself uh, not only the geography shape of the border of the city of Medina, but also it has all this different uh, faith and idea. Uh, we said before they had Jew and those Jew were divided into three big tribes. There's more tribes, but the three very well known, uh, Banu Nudair, uh, Bani Qaynuqa, uh, uh, Bani, uh, the, the third one, uh, I remember in a minute. So Al Qunayqa, uh, uh, were in the city of Medina, but not really exactly because the Jew likes to be uh, separated from the Arab and they created around themselves also this huge, they made it like a castle. So uh, the, the tribe is inside and they're surrounded by fortress. Those are Bani uh, Qaynuqa. But Bani Nadur, uh, they were more into the business and they were right in the heart of the city of Medina. Uh, and then the third group also in the, south, in the north. Uh, but subhanAllah, the Jews themselves, uh, they were uh, making treaty between Al Al Aus and Al Khazraj. These two huge tribes where the Arab on the city of Medina were divided uh, for hundreds of years. 
um, and uh, they, both of them were powerful. Uh, but Al Khazraj was a little bit stronger than Al Aus. But Al Aus was uh, supported by Nudur, the Jewish tribe, and Al Khazraj was supported by Qaynuqa. And they do that, why? To create a problem and calamity between the Arab in one city. You know, these are Jew, they're not fighting each other, but they take different allies. So when the fight come and the problem come, they unite and what happened, the fighting become between the Arab and they lived like this lifestyle for hundreds of years. SubhanAllah, that's why when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came and he bring the peace and the brotherhood between not only Al Muhajirin Al and Al Ansar, but also between the brotherhood in the city of Medina where they always fight, fought. For little things, even like kids will call each other, my tribe is stronger than your tribe. Something like that, then it will cause problem. Then they will fight. Then so many men, famous, uh, generous men from both sides will get killed because of stupid idea like that. SubhanAllah. So they put the weapon down and who will make the weapon in the city of Medina? Only the Jew. Baini Qaynuqa, only the, those are the ones who they curve the sword and they do the weapon and they do the uh, armor and they sell it to who? To the Arab. But subhanAllah, they were into this uh, business. And on top of that, they're the one who controls the silver and the gold in, this, in the city of uh, Medina in the market. Those are Qaynuqa. So they control the gold silver and weapon. Those are the three important things for any society to become strong and rich. SubhanAllah. So let's see what Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did for Bani Salim. So when uh, when that when they heard that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came out with his army, Bani Salim ran away to the mountains and they left uh, like three miles away from the city of Medina. And then they left behind them, look the number, 500 cannon loaded with the food and whatever they were gonna use it to fight and to come to attack the city of Medina. 500 cannon. So what did Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got? He got, and who was watching the camel for Bani Salim? A servant man called Yasar. So Yasar was captured. The camel was captured. They brought them to the city of Medina. And according to Surah Al-Anfal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divided the, the uh, spoil of the war, right? Even though there is no war, but there is spoil. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he got Yasar, which is a shepherd man, as to be his slave. And he freed him immediately. And he told him, you have an option. Come to Islam or you're free. And uh, uh, the uh, 500 camel divided one-fifth for the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He will do whatever he wants to do. And the other four-fifths divided between, between those people who they came out with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And almost they were 250 men. Everybody got two, two camel uh, by just going for three days. They spent three days uh, and three nights in the area of Bani Salim. And that we call it Ghazwa because again, we said Ghazwa if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam go out with a group of men who wants to fight. And we call Syria if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam announce somebody will lead that group and go out without him. So these are Ghazawat. Look how much your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was ready to fight, to spread this religion and to stop the disbelievers from ending for, the, for his da'wah. The second one says, Ghazwat aswaiq. Uh, aswaiq uh, in Arabic, it's a kind of food. When they bring the wheat and the rye and they dry it, then they suck it into honey and milk and they dry them. It become, uh, it become lumpy and dry. So you make a soup, you cook it with meat, you cook it with vegetable. Uh, SubhanAllah, that called aswaiq bil Arabi. So we used to do it in our home. My mom will bring the uh, burghul, which is a wheat, right? And they will make the wheat 
uh, they will put yogurts pura and then they will uh, make it like a dough and then they will bring a, a, a spread uh, a clean sheet in the sun and we put uh, pieces pieces of this huge lump they made it to make it dry and you flip it you turn it it might take uh, you know, usually in Middle East, no rain in summer. So uh, it will dry under the sun, subhanAllah. Then after that, uh, sometimes they crush it to make it like a powder and become soup. Or they make them a little bit, uh, um, not too fine. And uh, um, remember, people did not have electricity back then and they did not have that type of market today. You go out, you buy all the time fresh food. We call it fresh food, but no organic, right? Back then, yes, the, the food the, you're going to eat, the soup you're going to eat, it's all, but at least it's organic, <laughs> subhanAllah. So uh, the, when I went to Florida to my son, uh, Omar, I bought, I went to Turkish store and I bought that kind of food to make it soup once a while for my uh, uh, lunchtime, subhanAllah. So that is a swayq. Who's carrying this a swayq? Uh, Abi, Abi Sufyan himself. Abi Sufyan came with 200 horses. Horses, not common. 200 horse from Mecca, and he wants to go to Najd. Tariq al Najdiya. Najd is right in the middle of Arabia, Saudi, which is Mecca and Medina. I come to the, to the western uh, border, subhanAllah. So, in that way, where, and then he went to Hay Bani Nadir. So, even the Jew, they have the market in the middle of the city of of uh, Mecca, but Bani Nadir also, they have their building and uh, outside of the Mecca in the north. So where is Abi Sufyan came? He came to do this business by the Najd road, but he came and he uh, landed in Qabilat and Nudair, which is the Jewish tribe. Remember, the Jew and the Kuffar also, some of them in the city of Medina, they have treaty, like Abdullah bin Salul, uh, he has a treaty with with the Jew and people of Mecca always have treaty with the with the Jew. There is no fight between of them, but they do the business. So if they come as a guest, they will honor them and they will protect them from their enemy. Vice versa, also the Jew will go there. But <laughs> Rasulullah said, when he came to the city of Medina, remember he did two separate treaty, one for the Muslimin. Uh, of of uh, Medina, right? The one who accepted Islam, and the one who did not accept Islam yet, Al Mushrikeen. They were they were a very small number, and they were one out, day after day they were coming to Islam. But the other treaty he made it with the Jew, with all the tribes, uh, seven of them. But these three are big. He made a treaty with them, and one of the treaty, we're not gonna fight you. You're not gonna fight us. But we're not gonna. Uh, protect your enemy when they come to the city of Medina, neither you're going to protect my enemy. Because when you protect my enemy, that's mean my enemy is in your house. Now, may, maybe my enemy will come and kill me and fight me, right? Overnight, vice versa, the same. I'm not going to protect your enemy in the same city when they come to me. So that's one of the treaty Rasulullah made it with the Jew and they signed, they agreed. So now what they doing, Bani Nadir? They will come to Abi Sufyan, who is ready to fight Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who he has 200 horse, and he has a lot of products of a swayq, that kind of uh, food. So Bani Nadir will come to Abi Sufyan, they made a party, they ate, they drank, and they gave every secret movement of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the believers to Abi Sufyan. And who is Abu Sufyan? The leader, the big general of Bani uh, Quraysh, of, of the enemy. And he even uh, they even gave him all the path Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa take when he goes out everything about the movement of the uh, believer and the preparation for any uh, you know upcoming war subhanallah so they were spying on rasulullah sallallahu to abi sufyan so they told abi sufyan if you want to attack the city of medina there is a nahiyat al urayd they call it it's a valley in the city of medina just come there from there it's easy to attack the city of medina immediately rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam got the news and he sent two people to the opening area of the city of Medina, and they attack Abi Sufyan al caravan. We're going to call it caravan. And they killed right there two of their people. And Abi Sufyan's army 
attack back and they killed two of the Muslim and they set up fire on one of the palm tree. So the, the, the fight started uh, immediately. فَتَعْقَبُهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم says the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم himself, he got ready uh, with 200 men from Ansar and Muhajirin and he ran after Abi Sufyan but because Abi Sufyan he got the news fast and they have horses, they run away. But while they were running away with their horses, their horses carry the food and the goods where they were going also to continue their journey to do the business, right? So they start unloading, unloading their animal so they can, the horse can run fast with a, with a rider, uh, rather the, you know, with, with the load. So subhanAllah, the whole path was full of these bags and these bags full of the aswaiq. That's why it says Ghazwat uh, Aswaiq. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they captured they, all these bags, they collected them and they brought them to the city of Medina and the food was massive food in the city of Medina and he divided as uh, the way uh, he was told by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. SubhanAllah, that's, that's what they captured from Abu Sufyan. So that's the second Ghazwa. The third Ghazwa called Ghazwat the Amr. You're going to forget these uh, names, but that's okay. But at least what we're not going to forget is the preparation of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the readiness to defeat the disbelievers. Because the disbelievers always are thinking they're big, they're large, they're powerful, and they're rich. And they think they have a way to, you know, if not this uh, battle, the second battle, they're going to defeat the Muslim. That's that's their opinion. But here it shows you that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, himself, the head of the Ghazawat, and himself ready. Anytime he hears that somebody is coming to attack the city of Medina, he's ready. Even as small as 200 army, let's go. The minute he will call whoever ready, they will go with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So let's see the third one, the Amr. جاءت الأخبار من قبل رجالات الأخبار الإسلامية. Okay, it says ثعلبة and محارب two tribe of the Arab around the Medina are getting together and they hired this leader called دعثور, you know, a leader of them to come and to fight رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم and they're gonna attack the city of Medina immediately at night. ف Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he assigned Uthman bin Affan to be the one in charge in the city of Medina. And he took 450 of the Muslimin, some of them riding, some of them walking. And they came out and they attacked uh, Sa'laba and Muharab, the two tribe. Before they, they attacked them, they went after them. And when they went after them, uh, um, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam captured one of the men of that tribe called Jabbar bin Bani Thalaba. But Jabbar bin Bani Thalaba, in secretly, he was Muslim. He came with the kuffar and he loosened up. So the army of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when they captured him and they brought, uh, they brought him, the Prophet, no, he came and he whispered in the ear of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he told him exactly where their, these tribe getting together, what is their plan. It's a spy, it's an eye of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He told him everything in detail in his ear. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he kept it as a secret and he uh, he went after Bani Thalaba and Muharibu Malabithu. Uh, he went after them when, we're, when they saw that the Prophet came with 450 army, right? So they ran away. They ran away to the mountains. And what did they catch? They catch their leader. The, the leader couldn't run that fast. Da'thur bin al-Harith. When they catched him, they brought him to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, so let's see now what's going to happen. When they brought uh, Dathur to his tent, uh, to uh, coming to his tent, so he had his weapon in his hand, but he saw the Prophet going a little bit out of his tent. I, I guess he's going to do his business. So he's going after a tree, by, by, by a nearby tree. So he sneaked out and he went after the Prophet and he saw now the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all by himself, taking his clothes off, 
his shirt off. Probably he's about to take a shower or he's about to do his, you know, he wants to do something. And the Prophet has, he's, he has a bare chest, no armor, no weapon, nothing in his hand. It's like up naked. So immediately, what did Da'thur mean? He took his sword out and he captured the neck of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he put the sword on his neck. And he told him, I got you, Ya Muhammad. Man yamna'uka al-yawm minni. Who will stop me from you today? Immediately, he could slout the neck of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam answered immediately. He said, Allah. The minute he said Allah, Jibreel alayhi salam will come. He pushed this Da'thur man away and he will knock him on his chest, right? And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa look at him and he take his sword away from him. Now he's doing the opposite. And he attacked Da'thur carrying his own sword and he will tell him, Man yamna'uka minni al-yawm ya Da'thur. Who will stop me from killing you ya Da'thur? And that minute, the Athur says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa annaka rasulullah. I believe. He saw the miracle with his eyes. The leader of Bani Thalaba wa Muharib converted to Islam. And that's in the tribe. If your leader become Muslim, you're going to be a Muslim. If your leader become a, a Polytheist, you become a polytheist. <laughs> the minute uh, this man, he accepted Islam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave him back the sword and he told him, go back to your own people. Do whatever you want to do. Do, you're free. So he took his sword back and he ran to his people and his people waiting because they ran away for their life. And they said, what happened? We thought you were captured. They're going to kill you. He goes, Wallahi ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. He said, they said, what happened? He said, I saw the miracle with my eyes. I saw when I have the sword in my hand and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam naked from the stomach and up, no, nothing to protect him from me. I am about to kill him. A huge tall man came. He pushed my chest. He knocked me down. And then the prophet got the sword and he almost killed me. But when I say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, he did not kill me. I believe that was an angel. And I believe Muhammad is a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do you think, people? They all said, You are our leader. If you accepted Islam and you accepted Muhammad to be the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are behind you. And that's how Da'thur came and all his tribe, who they were ready to kill Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, accepting Islam. And shows you how the mercy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What if he killed Da'thur that minute? Right? He was in charge of him. Somebody came to, you know, to kill you and you got your hand on his weapon with a gun or a sword. Now you kill him with his own weapon, nothing, no blame on you. You defense yourself, not only with your weapon, but with the same weapon he came to kill you. But if he killed him, Da'thur will be in hellfire and his tribe won't have the chance to come to Islam. And this is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa rahmah lil alameen. He's nobody but a mercy for all mankind. He will never kill anyone. All he care is for those people to come to Islam, not to kill them. Not to kill them, not to scare them, not to make them run, run away from him. It's the opposite. He wants to bring them into this beautiful religion into this peaceful religion, subhanAllah. And ayah and Surat Al-Ma'idah came just because of the way Da'thur came to Islam. So ayah, Surat Al-Ma'idah, number 11 says, Ya ayuhal ladina amanu, Allah reminded the believers and Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with the favor, how Allah defends the believers. He reminded them with this ayah, says, Ya ayuhal ladina amanu, izkuru ni'mat Allahi alaykum. Remember the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who came to you. إِذْهَمَّ قَوْمٌ أَنْ يَبْسُطُوا إِلَيْكُمْ أَيْدِيَهُمْ Group of people came and this one man came. He extended his hand to just kill you that minute, right? فَكَفَّ أَيْدِيَهُمْ عَنْكُمْ Who stopped them? Allah. Who stopped this man? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So remember that favor. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ 
come fear Allah وعلى الله فليتوكل المؤمنون this is a result when you have a fully dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah will fight for you you just have to prepare yourself you just have to be brave you just have to be skillless and you have to do your part then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala maybe this facing is not a comparable war but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the victory somehow Allahu Akbar that's how Da'thur bin al-Harith came to Islam so number four Ghazawa Ghazawat Bahran this Ghazawa now we're about to enter the first month of the third year of Al-Hijrah Jamad al-Ula وقد خرج النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم the prophet uh, prepared with the 300 from the believers he going to Bahran Bahran is a city between Mecca and Medina and he was to fight again Bani Salim the same tribe who couldn't fight them before because they ran away, they ran away fast and before he reached their city what happened all the people in that bill in that city in that tribe where they usually have they ran away already everybody ran uh, they leave behind them food sometimes children sometimes a woman who cannot run so they leave everything behind and the men run into the mountains subhanallah and sorrowful wa'ad and prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi he spent 10 nights on that path on that road and he came back with no fight with no nothing he came Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam back. But all this preparation and the educational combat, the prophet doing training course after course, only making the image of the government of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stronger, stronger in the eye of the disbelievers, whatever those disbelievers are, right? Because every time they see it, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, okay, no fight. If they fight, they kill maybe one or two. Then they end up, the enemy losing their property, their animal. Animals are very important in, 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 in Arabia. It's like a car and a tank. You know, imagine now the Jew leave all their tanks and cars running uh, in Gaza and they leave for their life. What's going to do the people of Gaza? They're going to ride these vehicles and they're going to use them. You know, some, some picture, it's happened exactly the same. They fix some of these vehicles and they use them, subhanAllah. And now you have the horse, you have the camel, and exactly what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa get from them, he get, he, his government become wealthier and wealthier and wealthier, subhanAllah. Now, number five, Sariya. Sar this is Sariya, not a Ghazawa. That means the Prophet did not go out with them. But he assigned Zayd bin Haritha, and this they call it Sariya al Qurada. It's another town called Al Qurada. Um, now, as we said, uh, the Mushrikeen in Mecca, they're not resting. Uh, Badr was a very uh, big slap on the face. Yes, there are six, seven leaders get killed. But now they're not resting. Abi Sufyan also swear he will never take a shower. He will never clean himself unless he will defeat Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and to take revenge, right? Of all the leaders get killed because Abi Sufyan did not fight with Badr. Abi Sufyan was the head of the caravan, but the people of Quraysh came out because that caravan was gonna be attacked by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa his army, right? So now Abu Sufyan himself, he did not fight. His wife, because her father, her uncle, her brother get killed Hind, the same Hind bin Utbah. Utbah died and Utaybah died and Umayyah bin Khalaf died, Al-Walid bin uh, uh, died, Abu Jahl died. So Hind swear she will never give uh, 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 a relationship in bed with her husband till he take that revenge for her father, brother, and uncle. She sweared, just like Abi Sufyan sweared with the idols, he's not gonna take a shower. Same uh, hint said she's not gonna brush her hair, she's not gonna dress up the morning. She's not gonna dress up, she's not gonna sleep with her husband till they take the revenge of those dead people in the city. So they're mourning, they're crying. They're, they they got to find a way. they got to find a way to attack Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and people of Medina. So, um, so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got news that there is a caravan coming to Bilad Najd because they can't pass now Bilad the Sham. If they're going to come the pass to Damascus, it's going to happen exactly the way they attack the caravan of 
uh, Abi Sufyan, only Abu Abi Sufyan was faster and he was safe. So now they're very much afraid to use the same path to go to do their business. And if people of Mecca don't do any business, they're gonna die. That's their number one depends in their uh, financial style. So they said, okay, we're gonna use Najd. Najd is closer to Iraq, the Eastern side of uh, deep uh, central Saudi, they call it Bilad al-Najd. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also was smart. So he sent Zayd bin Haritha to that path, go stay there till Abi Sufyan or any caravan coming to do business. But this time, who came as a leader of the business? Again, Abi Sufyan and Safwan bin Umayyah, the son of bin Umayyah bin Khalaf. Safwan and Abi Sufyan, both of them are the head. And another one, Huayi Tab bin Azza, if you forget the names, that's okay. And they have silvers, gold, value 100,000 dirham. 100,000 dirham caravan business coming. It's going to go to Bilad al-Sham, but they're going to take the path of Najd. It's far from Medina. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard that their preparation. So فَبَعْثَ Zayd bin Harith. So he said, uh, Zayd bin Harith, that go, you have a 100 rakib, 100 uh, riders, uh, whether camel or horse, they have it, and go attack that caravan. فَلَقِيَهَا زَيْدْ عِنْدَ مَا إِنْ يُقَالِ لَهُ الْمَقْرِدَةِ الْقِرَدَةِ الْقُرْدَةِ الْقُرْدَةِ So Zayd reached the area uh, where wherever there is water, that's where the caravan has to stop to drink water and to refill what they have. Exactly that area called الْقُرَدَةِ وَهُوَ مَاءٌ مِنْ مِيَهِ نَجْدْ One of the area, it's a lake by Najd. فَفَرَّ رِجَالَهَا مَزْعُورِينَ When they saw the, uh, the, the believers with Zayd bin Haritha, which is a very well known in the city of Mecca, are there already? They ran away to tell Abi, so uh, Abi Sufyan and Safwan, look, the Muslimin are here. They're here. Oh my God. So, uh, so the Prophet Sallallahu army, uh, they attacked those caravan. They captured uh, the man who's going to show them the road. Because you cannot travel in the desert unless you have some leaders. That's their GPS. So the leader called Furat bin Hayyan has nothing to do for Quraysh. He's nothing to do with the, with the Muslim. Meaning. He's not a Muslim, but he's, he's not there to fight. But he is the Dalal. He is the one who's guiding them in this desert, right? He is their eye, GPS. They captured for, uh, Furat bin Hayyan. He accepted Islam with the hand of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and they captured all their wealth because when the enemy ran away, they leave their animal loaded with their wealth. 50, how much? 100,000 dirham value of gold and silver. They brought them all by this 100 men and the head was Zayd bin Haritha to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa with Burat which is a guy who will guide them to the path, to the road. And Furat bin Hayyan himself accepted Islam in the hand of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet divided this wealth, as Surah Al-Anfal says, one-fifth for the Prophet and the rest for the people who went to do the fight. So that, those are five. Four of them was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one with Zayd bin Haritha Sariya, no, no killing, but always the Muslim got wealth. So now this is the most important, and we're going to stop after this. It says, Ghazwat Bani Qaynuqa. Why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to decide to attack the Jewish tribe, which is resided in, in their uh, fortress, inside their fortress, and those are Bani Qaynuqa, very large group of uh, the Jew. But as I mentioned in the beginning, Qaynuqa are the one who they are in a business of making, uh, what we call it, Smith, right? Uh, blacksmith, they call it the, Amer the American. They make the sword, they make all the weapon for the any world. So they're the one who sells the, the weapon. And they're the one who controls the market in the city of Medina of the gold and silver. So if one, someone wants to make a jewelry, fix their jewelry, it, buy, sell, they control the gold market.
We have them in Damascus. Everyone who controlled the gold jewelry and the diamond jewelry in Damascus in my time, 60s and 70s and 80s, I left 86 Damascus, the markets were controlled by the Jew. New York, who controlled the diamond market? The Jew. They know how to do business. So same with Qaynuqa. So what happened is a very, very, very beautiful story. We have to understand. So now, uh, Bani Qaynuqa, uh, they have agreement with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? The agreement is a peaceful agreement. We're not going to fight you. You're not going to fight us. We're not going to protect any your enemy. You're not going to do the same. And uh, they already fought, fought. But when they saw Bani Quraysh, right? Quraysh people were defeated and they're mourning, they're crying. They have agreement with their allies. So Bani Qaynuqa felt unhappy. So our friends are defeated. You know, they start spreading the news about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bad news. They start threatening the believers. You know, just a talk, just a talk. They're not doing anything, but just a talk. What do they say? Oh, you think you defeated Quraysh? You killed six, seven men of their leader. Let me tell you, they have no skill of fighting. We are skilled. We're the one who make the weapons. We're the one who make the uh, armors and the sword. What do you think? We know how to fight. Only if you face us, we will slout every believers, including your own prophet. They start, tahdeed, they start saying all this aggravation word against Muhammad وسلم, and his followers. Oh, you think you're strong now just because you defeated Quraysh? No. Only if you defeat us, we will show you what kind of people we are. And actually, they start saying it as slowly, slowly. Now they start saying it louder in the city of the market of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa which is in the market of Medina. And they said, Ya Muhammad, they, they start talking when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is in the market. They will say, Oh Muhammad, la yagurrannaka min nafsik. Don't feel so big and so powerful. You only killed few people from Quraysh, but they don't know how to fight. Only if you fight us, we will show you what kind of people we are. You will never face anybody like powerful, uh, as powerful, as skilled as, as us. But you have an agreement with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi How could you talk like that? So now it start start uh, words, but the words what set up the fire. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala spoke from above. The Prophet did not say anything, but Allah says, "Qul ladina kafaru." Tell those disbelievers, "Satughlabun." You will be defeated. وَتُحْشَرُونَ إِلَىٰ جَهَنَّمْ You will be gathered in the hellfire. وَبِئْسَ الْمَصِيرِ Wow of ending. Just the ayat from Allah. Allah is the one who's talking. Because the Prophet وسلم, he came to the city of the center and he went to the businessmen of Qaynuqa people, the leaders, and he told them, accept Islam. Enter Islam. It's going to happen exactly the way we defeated people of Quraysh. That's when they said, no way, no way. You just fight us and you will see what kind of men we are. But the Prophet وسلم, keep spreading his da'wah. He, he really worry about them. He wants them to come to Islam because now it's clear. The ayah is clear. Allah says, it's the future. You will be defeated. Then after that, you will be gathered in hellfire. قَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ آيَةٌ فِي فِئَتَيْنِ التَّقَتَى You saw with your eyes. Two people get together, which is people of Quraysh and Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم, 300 faced 1,000 army. فِئَتَيْن فِئَةٌ تُقَاتِلُ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ One group was fighting in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, they were small, small number. Yes, they were, uh, they didn't have uh, preparation much. Right? They didn't have skill of fighting. The other group were kafir. They were prepared. They have a lot of wealth. 
يَرَوْنَهُمْ مِثْلَيْهِمْ رَأْنَا الْعَيْنِ You saw with your eyes how Rasulullah sallallahu and the small army of him were defeat, they defeated the larger army. You saw them with your eyes. وَاللَّهُ يُؤَيِّدُ بِنَصْرِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ You heard the story and you saw how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, supported his own army, the army of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the miracles happened in that battle. It's going to happen again. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَعِبْرَ لِأُولِي الْأَبْصَارِ Only if you have a vision, people of uh, Bani Qurayza, you will take a sign and you will learn a lesson from what just happened. But would they? Let's see. So what was the reason now for this battle to happen? The battle happened and the defeated happened, but let's see what happened. So a woman come from the Arabian outside of Medina and she come completely, she covered her face she did some business in the market, and after that, she got some uh, gold in her hand. She went to a jewel jeweler, uh, and she sat by him, and she asked him to make from the gold she brought it with her some kind of jewelry for her to wear it. And while the man was working on her jewelry, and that this is uh, remember, it's a Jewish. They all Jew are surrounded. All the markets are Jew, but they're in the heart of the city of Medina. And uh, people start uh, coming around and they're looking at her and said, why you don't show us your pretty face, pretty woman? Why are you hiding your face from us? Open, but she's completely covered. She's Ayatul Hijab came and she's completely uh, a modest woman co covered. And just like today, you know how the girls was modest, the other one will mock you or show me your hair, you got no hair, you're baldy, or they will call you names. They start teasing this woman. Open your face, show us your face, including the man who's working on her told her also, I wanna see your face. She keeps saying, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do that. So a man came from behind her back and he picked up her shirt. You know, she's sitting on the floor. He picked up her dress is big. He tied the end of the dress by her neck with her scarf without her noticing. So now when she finished her business, she got up, right? She got up to walk away. What happened? Instead of showing the face now, showing her aura, all the way her legs in the back. It's not her private, private, but her legs showing all the way. It's naked now. And because the dress was up, she doesn't know. When that minute happened, everybody started laughing. They said, oh, we didn't see your face, but we saw your private from the back. So when she did this, she touched herself. When they were laughing at her, she did herself. She found out, you know, her dress was somehow was tied. She screamed. When she screamed, uh, she starts screaming. Uh, the market has a Muslim and non-Muslim, right? In the city of Medina. A man came and he exactly saw what's happening and what they did with this woman and the Jew standing and laughing. So he went to that jewelry man. He chopped his head off and he killed him. And the minute he killed him, the Jews are not going to let that go, right? They attack the Muslim man and they kill the Muslim man. By that time, I witnessed, ran to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa masjid and they told exactly in detail what happened in the market. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, immediately he got up, he put his armor, he took his sword and he asked the people to come and fight the tribe of Qaynuqa. They broke the treaty. They disturbed one of our women they killed one of the Muslim, and now we're gonna teach them a lesson. So when the Prophet ﷺ prepared his army and he said, we're gonna go fight, he asked Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib to uh, carry the flag. The flag means symbolic of war. And I mean, they're in the middle, in the Bainuqa, first fortress are here, but they're in the market in and out. They're not far from two, three miles away only from the rest of the city of Medina. It's not like you don't need that many walking and anything, but the Prophet ﷺ prepared and he called the army. The people got up and they all dressed up to fight. And he asked Hamza to carry the liwa, you know, the, the flag, that's mean, that's it, we're announcing. And he asked Abi Lubaba to watch the city of Medina while they're gonna march to the fortress of Bani Qaynuqa. So when the Jew, they, they heard that the Prophet وسلم, coming to their you know, excluded town, they all run away inside and they close the door. Now they're inside this castle. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, surrounded, he held up, 
15 long days. No one can come out, no one can go inside. And because this surrounding just happened overnight, they were not ready. They did not have enough food or enough drink inside till Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will tell them, if you don't surrender, we're going to attack you and we're going to come inside and we're going to kill you one by one. If you want to surrender, you will surrender, you will open the door, you will come out surrendering, then you have to accept hukm Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You have to accept what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's rule. Whatever he's going to do with you, if he's going to let you go, if he's going to kill you, if he's going to punish you, whatever hukm Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, no argument, no nothing, or we are here to kill you. After 15 long days, they surrounded, uh, they were surrounded by the army, they surrendered. So the leaders came and they said, we accept. We accept the rule of Rasulullah we can't hold it anymore. So when they were, they opened the door, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa asked men, uh, and the head of them was Al-Munzir bin Qadam al-Salami, says al -Awsi. he said, every man of their men was tied up by rope. How many men they have? Qaynuqa is the strongest tribe, the richest tribe. And that's why they were showing off. They have 700 men ready to fight. 400 of them did not have the armor yet. They were inside their homes. 300 of them, they were ready to fight that minute. They have their armor, they have their sword next to them. But when they surrendered and the door was open, they went inside all the believers one by one. They tied up all these men and they put them to lay down next to each other and no one can move. Who will hear now this, this story happening? Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Salul. Remember Abdullah? We said, we mentioned a little bit his name before. He is the head of the hypocrites in the city of Medina. Why he became so hypocrite and Islam did not go to his heart. He accepted with his tongue, but he's just inside. He hates Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is coming to the city of Medina was a reason for him to lose the crown. He was the one who was selected his Khazraji, Khazraj, the Arab, Khazraj and Aus. Khazraj was bigger and stronger and they chose Abdullah to be their leader, their king. Khalas, Aus and Al-Khazraj, they're gonna, you know, become brothers and they're not gonna fight no more and they're gonna choose one leader, one king and they're gonna assign him the kingdom. They're gonna give him the crown as the Jew have a king. That was Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul. But, the upcoming of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, city of Medina ruined every plan they had. They said, we don't need king no more. We all becoming Muslim. Our king, our leader, our general, our beloved one is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They don't need king no more after Qudum Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? So that caused animosity of the heart, you know, hub dunya he, he was dreaming he's going to be king one day and that dream fall apart of because of the coming of Rasulullah sallallahu to his city. So he hated the prophet, but he has to say, I am a Muslim because he played the hypocrisy here. At the same time, he has his own contract as a leader of Khazraj with Qaynuqa, remember? Because he has to buy the weapon from them and they were a lie. So when he heard that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with his army, they tied up the 700 men of the Jew and now they're waiting whatever Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if he's gonna behead them, let it be. Whatever the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is gonna rule, they're gonna accept. That was a condition or otherwise they were gonna destroy the palace on, on, on them. Abdullah bin Sadul came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam begging him. Ya Rasulullah, he's saying, Ya Muhammad. He's telling him, Ya Muhammad, arsilhum, arsilhum means let them go, let them go, let them go. Those are my ally. Those are my friend. I have contract with them. Let them go. So he's speaking what? Shafi'ah. He's, he's showing intercession for the Jew to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let them go, let them go. Don't kill them, don't kill them. 
But the Prophet وسلم, every time Abdullah come to his face, he does not answer him. He put his face this way, he put his face that way, and he's not answering him. But Abdullah went back up. Abdullah, he came and he put his hand between the armor, Rasulullah was ready to fight. The armor he's wearing, and between his bare skin, he put his hand inside and he's holding the neck of Rasulullah He said, Ya Rasulullah, let them go, let them go, let them go. So now the Prophet has to be wise. If he kill all this Jew right there, Al Khazraj with their leader, they might say, Wow, those are our ally. Look, the Prophet kills them. And their hadith al ahad. They just came to Islam. This is the third year only. They just accepted Islam. That you know, it's not like the people of Muhajireen. The matter what you do with them, you could separate their head from their body, like uh, Bilal Ahad on Ahad. The faith and the aqidah, the foundation was rooted deeply, but not in the heart of the people of Khazraj. Yeah. And they looking at, to Abdullah, their leader, begging Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to let Bani Qaynuqa uh, go. And they're just waiting, what the Prophet's going to do? Hear the wisdom of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, even though he hated, even though he wants to kill and chop the head of every Jew that day, he said, okay, okay, let me go. So Abdullah backed up and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam announced and that all the people of Bani Qaynuqa leave the city of Medina, leave your house for three days. You have three days. Take with you whatever you want. Take gold, jewelry, furniture. You have only three days. And he assigned a head of them. That man will look after them and they have a three days to empty their town and go to the north. Go to Bilad al-Sham, wherever you want to go, go. Out of the city of Medina. So that's how people of the Jew Qaynuqa left the city of Medina. Mm -hmm. And in three days, they asked more. He said, Wallah, the Sahabi said, Wallah, I will never give you five minutes after the three days passed because I signed the contract with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and will protect the word of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He gave you three days to empty the city. He gave you three days. No more, no less. And then they left all the way to the border of Medina. So what happened? Those are the people who they were talking big talk. We're a fighter. You don't know us, right? There was no fight. They were tied up, their hands and their neck with a rope, and they were slay, laid on the floor. And then, till Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam let them go. But leave the city of Medina. That was it. And whatever they carry with them, they carried. But how much money and gold and jewelry you can carry when you have so much, right, in your house, furniture and valuable. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam put his hand on their property, and they left the city of uh, Medina. And after that, many ayat came. How you deal with the disbelievers. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, there is like 15 ayat. I'm not going to read them all. But Surah Al-Ma'idah, all about the rules of the kafirin, when they misbehave, what is a Muslim has to do, how you're going to deal with them, and on all by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he prescribed the jihad and the fighting on the believers, the believers took it seriously. They did not pack up, back up at all. So now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has to cleanse the city of Medina from all those bad rotten apples. If someone was spreading the news, uh, you know, because this kind like media today, you know how many you have on Fox News, CNN, you have people who they, you know, they only talk about the believe the Muslim are terrorists every time they use uh, Hamas is terrorist organization and every time they talk about the Jew they have right to defense themselves you know those type of news makers right so the same in the city of Medina had people who they make news against Muhammad sallallahu and against the believers but even men or women even women were not spared so this was a woman named Asma bint Marwan she will talk so ill and bad about Prophet Muhammad himself. 
and she will spread the gossip and she will spy on the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and she will condemn Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with her bad word, then the Prophet announced, who will kill Asma? Even though the Prophet never killed women or never allowed to kill women, but this woman has to die. So it says, فَقَدْ أَقْدَمَ عُمَيْرُ بِنْ عُدَيِّ الْحُطَمِي رضي الله عنه He said, I will, Ya Rasulullah. And he went after her and he killed her. And then مَقْتَلْ أُبَيْ عَفْكَ الْيَهُودِ It was when uh, originally he was Arab, but he converted to Jew or vice versa. He's a Jew, Abban Anjad from grandfather, but he lived with the Arab tribe. And his name was Ubay um, Afk al Yahudi. He was Sheikh Kbir. He was old, like a rabbi, knowledgeable man. But he lived in the Bani Auf, Amru bin Auf, or Arab tribe. But he is a Jew living there among them. But he will say the poets to condemn Rasulullah and to belittle him. And he was, you know, causing fitan, spreading bad news about a Muslim. Also, Rasulullah knew about him and he announced who will kill him and somebody went and he killed him. And the third one, Ka'b bin al-Ashraf, also he was a very, very bad man. He will say all kinds of poets. He will go to the city of Mecca and he will condemn the Prophet and the believers and he will make people of Mecca cry over Badr. And he will encourage them to go and fight and your dead body in, in Abar Badr, screaming, calling for you. When are you going to come and take revenge of me? He will use poet and he will do it that. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to ask Hassan bin Thabit, the Muslim poet, right? To answer, to answer the uh, Ka'ab bin al-Ashraf with his poet. So Hassan will travel to Mecca and he will say the poet to describe the mercy and the kindness of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi and the ugliness of disbelievers and so on. SubhanAllah. Uh, it's just like the media now. SubhanAllah. It's the same weapon, whatever. So uh, also, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ka'b bin al-Ashraf got killed somehow. And now after that, we have to see how Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prepared uh, Asbab al-Ghazwa. Uh, exactly the preparation and the strengthen in a religious and political way of the city of Medina after all. This is almost one year past, the third year of Al-Hijrah. And all these things happen. Jazakumullahu khairan. I will stop here. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if I made anything wrong, it's my mistake. And anything right was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us understand the seerah, the biography of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how he handled every case, every, every single case happened back then. It, there is a case we can sim similar to our condition. So we can solve our condition the way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam handles his case, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakum Allah khairan wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'll stop here.